Happy Vogan Consortium News. Tell me about what happened. Uh, it all set off great, beginning at strike. I'm like, day one at Orgreave and that light. Uh, you've got all your local police. Yeah. Uh, there were no bother whatsoever. And then as days went on, yeah. we started shipping different police in from different areas of country. Yes. Like you met, you're going from Surrey, you're going from, well, everywhere in, across country. Yeah. And then things started changing. Did they surround you? Pardon? Did they surround yeah, you? Yeah, every day. Every day. You'd, you'd know for even to a movement or anything like that. Used to pen you in. Right. And uh, when did they start hitting you? When did they start the violence? Uh, it was just random, really. We, was we were it? playing, we were playing football and cricket and stuff like that. Yeah. Then you you, you see police building up, then the horses hanging about. Yes. Uh, and then next minute they just used to break ranks. Yeah. And then charge you. Oh. I mean, I was close a few days, me, one, one of the days, the choices, and I looked over my shoulder, and there were a policeman on a horse bike, just about to hit me with his truncheon, and I'd got to make a choice, either have some of that, yeah. or jump down this railway banking. Right. And it was steep like that. So I jumped down there, and I landed in an orphan bush at bottom. Oh, no. <laughs> so I, I was absolutely ripped to shreds, you know, oh, scattered yeah, I and know. all yeah. Like yeah. So... But yeah, you might have been, it might have been worse if he'd have got you. Oh, definitely. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, but to make choices in a split second like that, you know what I mean? Yeah. And stuff like that were happening every day. Yeah. So under what pretext did they do that? It wasn't illegal to strike, was it? No, no. I think uh, it was coming from Downing Street orders, you know what I mean? Because they knew for the fact if they brought NUM, yeah. uh, they, they were going to be okay with any other trade unions yeah Cause it's not as strong now is it unions and that do you know what i yeah, mean yeah yeah since we lost the battle yeah so, any excuse to to charges and have a voters and stuff like that i mean i can remember one but day you weren't breaking the law I know. weren't you in a field like an open yeah, field yeah so you weren't trespassing on anyone's land no no so how were you breaking the law how could that be justified it, it can't be can it uh, they just, because of the, the press we have in this country, when the news used to come on at night, they used to edit it so it looked like the miners were doing wrong. Uh, Do you know uh, what I mean? Yes. Well, what has changed? What no, has no, changed? Nothing, nothing. You know, this is happening in London as well, you know, with those anti-war yeah, protests. Yeah. Miners aren't violent. They'd help anybody out. Do you know of what course, I mean? Yeah. But they're trying to get it across as we yeah. are. And in fact, you helped each other out, didn't you? Yeah, yeah. yeah. It, was, it was an odd 12 months. Yeah. I mean, I'd got myself and two of the brothers that were on strike too. Yeah. So, thank God to my mother. She fed us every day and that, you know what I mean? As, yeah. as mothers do. Yeah. But yeah, it was a tough 12 months. I know. Did you lose a lot of money? You didn't lose your house or anything? No, because uh, I was courting then and I was stopping at my girlfriend's house. OK. Uh, yeah. I had not got a property then. Right. Thankfully. Oh, because so. I spoke to one or two people that, that lost their houses yeah, and everything. Yeah. At the uh, time. But when you used to go picketing, you used to get one pound a day to go picketing, and that's what we used to live on. <sighs> so like seven pound a week, and then we also go on coal tips if yeah. you've got any spare time yeah. and dig for coal yeah. oh. and then sell bags of coal for two pound a bag. Oh just, right. Just to get through. Right. Yeah. Just to get through. Yeah. And but was Arthur Scargill, was he around like a Yeah, seen him every day. And, oh yeah. yeah, yeah. Yeah. Encouraging you. Yeah. Well, yeah, encouraging us, but not, not for violence. No, no, of course just not. To make, just to make a stand. Yeah. We were fighting yeah. for his jobs. Well, that's right. <laughs> so, yeah, I've seen it all for most days at Aubrey. Yeah. Good leader. Yeah. He's, he's not one of these leaders who would sit in an office all day getting, getting orders out. He was, he was there. He was, he was on the job, but yeah. he's going to be here today, eh? This lad said Sorry. when the police, the photography was taken from behind them to make us look terrible when we were going in baseball shoes and flat caps <laughs> and beating the crappery in the field and putting the dogs and the horses on with well, this I'll tell you it was horrific and it wasn't until the night time us travelling back up north that I was on the bus to myself being 26 at that time saying oh, I just witnessed something 
that I've never seen and probably never see again. Brutality by the police, only by the police. Yeah. Oh, look out, by... there's a lot of it on film. It was, you can it, see it. it you, can really, see it. you were scared at times, weren't Very you? Yeah. Scared at times. We were only 26, me and Chris at the time. All grieve was orchestrated. Very much so. Oh, because we were turned, we've been picking on all the country and were turned around to certain yeah. spots. Yeah. Not all grieve you weren't. You yeah. were ushered. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Stop like on the, the motor, little big horn. Yeah. You were ushered into a certain place where they had were cornered, right? Everything was orchestrated. Yeah. Half of the police, which weren't police in my mind, army. Definitely. Army. Totally agree. Half the, no, Special no numbers. Forces. No numbers on there. So oh. they were drafted in by the army. Mm. Bloody right? hell. And Thatcher gave the order, kick the shit out of them, right? Yeah. So make sure they don't forget the day. Right? And we haven't forgotten the day, and that's why we're here now. Oh my God, look at, and that's the place, is it, down the bottom? Oh, yes, it is too. Oh. Thank you so much, You're sir. welcome. Yeah, I'll get that one. Yeah. There's one. They're marching. Oh, <laughs> 40 years on. Yeah, I got it. Mick Charles. Mick Charles? Yeah. And you come from Sheffield? No, Rotherham. Rotherham, okay, thank you. Bruce Whelan. Bruce Whelan from? West O'Colry, South Shields, NUM. <laughs> so Sam Coulter, West O'Colry, NUM, South Shields. A week before. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, uh, There's a little pump right there. Pete Harrison. From Sheffield? West O, South Shields. Oh, right, is that on the way from here? You're all Jodies. No, no. <laughs> we are, we are. Okay. You are. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. What happened afterwards? What happened to your life? Did you go back to work again? After what, the strike. Into another business? No, I or? went back down the coal mine. You did? Yeah, yeah, I did another four years. Four years? I finished in 1988. Yeah. So, yeah. And then you moved into, because you would still have been young then, wouldn't you? Yeah, uh, I would have been 21. I'd have been 25 when right. I left it. And then I went to work for a company called KP Foods. And? The peanut factory. Oh, right, yeah. So, what did you make? Uh, you know, peanuts. Oh, peanuts? Yeah. Oh, peanuts. Yeah, yeah we used to process them. And I hope you didn't work for peanuts. <laughs> <laughs> Not far off. <laughs> but yeah, yeah. So what did most people do? Like, did most people go back down the pit for a while like you yeah, did? Yeah, yeah, and then they started redundancies. Right. So they were thinning the manpower down then, do you know what yes, I mean? Yes, yes. So, a lot of lads had to, had to leave. And there were other industries created to uh, yeah, give yeah. those people jobs? Yeah, the, everybody went the, the different ways. The different ways. Yeah, variety of jobs. Yeah. But you kept contact with each other, did you? Yeah, best you can. We have a reunion every year. Yes. At our local Silwood uh, Miners Welfare. Yeah. So every year we have a, a reunion. Uh-huh. So I try and meet up with you know, some of your friends you've not seen for a while. Yeah, well, there's still quite a lot around. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Because a lot of you would have been really young at the time. Yeah. Truth and Justice campaign, who does an amazing job 
and, and she's here to tell you about some important information that's gathered. And I want you to keep an eye on our website on the 18th of June for a very important publication. So our first speaker is Kate Flannery, Secretary of the All Green Tudor District Um, I hope it doesn't get any worse, but if we say anything controversial, it might even start thundering a light in the middle of uh, But thank you to everyone who's come along to this very important rally and march today, and thank you to everyone who's campaigned with us over the last 12 years for an all green inquiry. Solidarity from the Old Green Truth and Justice campaign to those of you who are taking strike action and direct action for decent terms, conditions of pay and pensions. And to those of you who are at the forefront of other social justice campaigns and political struggles, and those engaged in the lasting campaigns for peace in Palestine and an end to racism and Israeli apartheid. This campaign started 12 years ago for an inquiry into events related to all grief on the 18th of June 1984. It is important to understanding what happened during the rest of the year long 1845 strike. An analysis of events relating to this one day can provide answers to how and why violent policing across mining villages and communities was allowed to happen throughout the strike. The injustice faced by the miners has never been acknowledged by the state and instead they have lied and covered it up. We already know from our research and campaign in another detailed research that many elements of the 1980s Tory government were involved in the strike while professing non-involvement. But Thatcher asked her government as early as 1981 to plan how they could withstand the coal strike. That the Conservative government actively put public resources, our money, into the implementation of this strategy and that during the strike there was a state-sponsored organisation against the miners and their livelihoods. From the government's own archives we read documents that confirm Parliament and the public were knowingly lied to. Government involvement in the strike and the policing of it have never been publicly acknowledged. The extent of the involvement requires an inquiry. The implementation of this Tory government plan also served to destroy the coal industry, which in 1984 directly employed approximately 880,000 people. Miners had powered Britain, providing the main energy source to most British industries for centuries, including through two world wars. Workers who wanted to save their industry provide British coal to industry and the wider population through gainful employment for themselves and the generations that followed were punished by the government with a militarised police pitted against them. Audrey marked a turning point in the strike and in the policing of protest. The extensive government interference in operational policing and in industrial relations seen in 1984 continues to this day. Questions remain about the origins of the brutal police tactics used and the operational manual in which they were fortified by the Association of Chief Police Officers and the Home Office in secret in 1983. Questions also remain about their application at Aldery and the origin of these tactics used in protest today. With no accountability of policing at Aldery, a message was sent to the police that they could employ violence with impunity. This set a culture that enabled the police cover up in the 1989 at Hillsborough. But police lied to the public and got away with it is contrary to the standards of police officers should be held to. Although our campaign is not after accountability of individuals, we do want an answers to questions about the systemic violence and lying behaviour of the police. We need to know how police officers on the ground were briefed and how that briefing came about. 
We need to know why the police were not held to account by the Director of Public Prosecutions or by their own employer. There is no doubt that events around our grave are of great public interest and concern and this is reason enough to hold an inquiry. It is about a government who actively worked against its own population was elected to serve. It is about handing the police paramilitary powers and destroying an industry in the process. By the government failing to look after those who wanted longevity of work in the coal industry and by failing to create new jobs in energy production to replace the jobs lost, this resulted in an immediate increase in coal imports from other countries employing cheap and non-unionised labour and in longer term in the destabilisation of Britain's energy security. This flies in the face of responsible government. The result was devastating to industrial Britain at every level, to individuals, communities and society. It also appears that in 2016, Amber Rudd, Home Secretary, was lent on by former government ministers who have been directly involved in the miners' strike and wanted to continue to cover it all up. This is borne out by indications in the media and to the Old Green Truth and Justice campaign that even the Tories were going to authorise an inquiry before the Home Secretary was forced by those people to change her position. The avoidance of an inquiry and lack of police and government accountability has continued to reinforce a culture that public servants can get away with horrific behaviour. Today, as many of you know, police at protests still violently attack people in such a manner that were they not wearing a police uniform would likely result in them being arrested, charged and brought before a court, if only they could be. However, the established police and government narrative remains help to try to restore public trust in government and police throughout an inquiry. The All Great Truth and Justice campaign wants the public to know the truth, to reset standards in public life, including that of the media. The media lied consistently to reinforce the operational independence of the police, to reset democratic diligence in public office, a public acknowledgement, an apology, what is important to our campaign is that due to the age and health of many minors, we quickly secure a public acknowledgement of why and what the state did to the minors and their communities. An inquiry of full disclosure can help to right the wrongs of the past and influence the future behaviour of the state and public officials. As such, an early and suitably empowered inquiry into government and police action in relation to events at Orgreave on the 18th of June is essential. We have been working really hard and on Tuesday the 18th of June, a very significant day, but this time 2024, a group of us from the campaign will be presenting a detailed report highlighting why we need an inquiry and what we expect from it. We will be delivering it to the Home Office and the main political parties. So we hope that you'll share that information far and wide. And thank you again everybody for coming along to support this campaign. Um, can we just give another massive clap for Kate and Chris from the Old Group campaign? We all know the women in the strike held the strike together. It wouldn't have lasted a year without the support of the women and all the work that they did. And on that point, there's two of the women against big closures stood right next to me. If you get a chance to have a beer with them later, they'll tell you some great stories, I'm sure. Um, but seriously, without Kate and Chris, this campaign wouldn't have got to where it is today. They do all the hard work in the background tirelessly writing reports and media releases and all the rest of it. So one more massive clap for Kate and Chris. As you know, the Old Green campaigns have worked hand in hand with many justice campaigns over the last 12 years. And that's where we've got our strength from. And so it's so important that I can now introduce Chad from the Student Palestinian Campaign Group. Yay! 
For 46 solid days, the students, staff and alumni at the University of Sheffield have sustained a rebellion against their university's odious profiteering and plundering of the Palestinian land and people. The University of Sheffield provides the fascist Israeli war machine with investments, research and labour power. In turn, the university garners for itself fat profits in the millions and perhaps even more. But through our encampment existing as a thorn in the side of the colluders and as sand in their eyes, we are successfully draining the university of tens of thousands of pounds, which otherwise would be spent on the instruments of modern warfare, such as bombs, bullets, jets and surveillance. We recognise the affinities which we share with the struggle of 1984. We are up against the media, the police, the disinterested and the opportunists and so on. We stand in that tradition of mass democracy which we share with the trade unions. We march on in the footsteps of the miners and though I myself never lived to see the horrors of that time, I think I speak for all the students when I say that we live in the long shadow of Thatcherism and Thatcherist repression. Our communities and our opportunities were stolen from us by the so-called Iron Lady. We refuse to accept the political destruction wrought by that tin bitch. As a final note, I shall say this. When remembering Audrey, remember also that the struggle is not over. It will never be over. Whether your mind is in the Congo or at Corton Wood, we're all Palestinians. something fundamentally different. An armed struggle against the people of this country, pre-planned, pre-ordained and pre-decided that they would fight and break communities to smash trade unions and smash collectivism everywhere. As I said, I was young once and my president's out there somewhere and we both started around 84 and our General Secretary at the time is a guy right called Ray Buckton who had a massive affinity with the mine workers. But more importantly, we had a president called Bill Ronsley, who came from this town, who knew what he was about, who knew where we should be and what we should be doing. And even though it was illegal, we would not move coal. They did not want the miners and the rail workers out on strike. And I do think it's to our eternal shame as a movement that we did not call for a general strike at that time. Because if they were scared of two unions, what would they have done if we'd all stuck together? But it went beyond that. I had a brass secretary called Red Andy Moynihan. 
and every day on payday when we used to get paid in cash, it was a pound for the miners. Every branch of ASDAF affiliated, right, and twinned with a pit from Kent to Scotland. On top of that, we had internal raffles and other fundraising methods. I remember this uh, miners' lamp that was raffled 400 times and never won, no one ever won it. <laughs> but it's those pragmatic things that we did where we stood together that I remembered where workers went and stood together at that moment in time. And you know, at the same time, it was a pragmatic trade unionism. A trade unionism that allowed Bill Moxley to go to the steel mills and allow just enough coke through, agreed by the NUM, to not hurt other workers' lives. Because that's what we can do as a trade union movement when we work together to look after each other. And it was the right thing to do. That experience has stayed with me. And it was my honour to speak with Arthur Scargill at Bill's funeral. And what he said about Asdef was so moving and inspiring. But if we thought Thatcher was bad, their grandchildren are a hundred times worse. We've had 40 years of anti-trade union legislation, the sixth richest nation in the world, 14 million people in poverty, 4.2 million children don't eat outside school time, right? And this is them looking after their 1%, looking after their own. It has to stop. It's the underlying cruelty of what they do and how they do it. Who in their right mind can introduce something like the bedroom tax? Who can introduce the two kid benefit cap? Who can actually boast about opening food banks? Who can actually say, oh dear, if the old are too poor to eat or heat, they can go to the local library, forgetting they've already closed the local library? Who can cut council budgets by 60% over 14 or 15 years? Who can destroy the future of our children and our grandchildren and take away that hope and aspiration that we sometimes enjoyed? When I look at them, it started with Cameron. He wanted Victorian values. Wasn't that shoving people up chimneys and down mines when they were kids? And then Victorian values were really about the rich will look after you. They'll be philanthropic. You can have the breadcrumbs on their table if they don't want them and only if they don't like you. And of course we moved from that to Sunak, because Sunak's gone from the Victorian times to the 50s, because we can have national service, whether you want it or not. People and kids on zero hours will have to give up their weekends to go work somewhere else, and how's that going to operate? But let's not forget in between, we had May and the Windrush scandal, then we had Boris, I've only got six minutes, I can't do Boris, I'm sorry. <laughs> the lying bastard. <laughs> and then we had Truss, who tried to destroy the economy in one weekend. But the tide is turning. We've seen the last few years. You've seen a summer, a winter, and a summer of solidarity. As we heard up here on this very platform last year, civil society and trade unions coming back together. People learning the value of class once more. And it's the right place to be. They call, we call it solidarity, they call it discontent. Well, let's keep doing discontent. We will not settle for a world where food banks are the norm and work does not pay. And while I'm here, I want to pay tribute to the current General Secretary of the NUN. I've been in those rooms with him where he's fought tooth and nail to get the Hillsborough Law in and all three recognised. Well done, Chris. <laughs> and if you look at their manifesto, the injustice of what they've done to miners, um, pensions over a period of time, will be addressed. Thanks again to the work that Chris Kitchen has done. Thank you, Chris. stand here and talk about the great struggle of miners without talking about our little struggle. We have been out for 23 months. I have never been more humbled, more proud to be leader of trade union. We return mandates of 95 to 95 percent for action, short the strike and strike action. And we will beat them. And when they couldn't beat us, they tried to change the law. They brought in minimum service levels. We said stick them up your ass. When they tried it, they had to. <laughs> We learn our politics, we learn our trade unionism from the miners and the people of the past. 
We learned the tactics of today for how to defeat them for what they did to the communities up here in the past. We need justice for all grieves, we need justice for everybody, but we need a brighter future for the working class, our kids, our grandchildren and a future, and you can deliver it, I hope to be there with you. Thank you for listening. Solidarity. indeed to us living in your uh, struggle. And hello sunshine! Um, our next speaker uh, was Maria Vasquez Iguala from the Chile Solidarity Campaign and Chile 50 Years Network UK. Unfortunately, she's unable to be here. She sends her support and love and solidarity. A fantastic woman leading, and that's who our next speaker is. We've already heard mention of women against pit closures, women of whom I'm so proud to have been inspired by myself, and I'm so pleased to introduce an amazing comrade sister, Rose Hunter from the North Staffordshire Miners Rise Action Group. Privilege 
to stand at meetings with the finest, most principled trade union leader ever, Arthur Scargill. I want to pay tribute not only to him, but to the magnificent work done in our mining communities on commemorating and celebrating our great strike. The weekend of solidarity hosted by the Door of Women Against Pit Closures, an event that brought women from all over the world to celebrate the role of women during the strike and since. One of our sisters is speaking up in Scotland at their day of celebration today. And we send solidarity greetings and salute the role of the Scottish miners who are also down here at Aubrey's. of people marching with our banners flying high through the village where 40 years previous the police had rampaged through down to the pit head and back up the club to hear Arthur speak. It was bloody amazing. And the young people contributing and doing their thing with the guidance of Mick Lanigan and his team. Awesome. Come on, industrial disputes 
involving over 200,000 of our members and we've won 82% of them disputes and that's put 430 million quid back into workers' pockets. There's only one way to beat the bosses and that's by organising collectively and getting out on the picket lines. So after the fight today, we hope to see you on the picket lines soon. So, the march is going to start and this is how it's going to work. You'll see stewards in red and yellow high visors, so please make sure you respect the wishes of the stewards. If everyone can start to form up behind the brass band outside Ask Italian, and behind the brass band it'll be the all green banner and then the miners' banners. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> 
I've been around one that got arrested most time, 18. Yeah. Them bastards got me. Oh no. <laughs> Where do all your badges come from? Uh, when I've been on picket lines and all that. Oh, my God. <laughs> That's dedication. <laughs> so you lived around here at the time? Doncaster. You lived, oh, we were in Doncaster last week. Oh, yeah. Yeah, we spoke to Mick Lanigan for about four hours. <laughs> oh, well. We're making a documentary. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I'm Press. Oh. <laughs> What's your name? Aggie. You're, yeah, they were pointing to you during the speeches. Well, they <laughs> You were some kind of force at the time, is that right? Somewhat. <laughs> some kind of force of nature at the time. Yeah, <laughs> So to, my husband used to shout, you want to see your mum, she don't tell her. <laughs> so what did the women do during the strike? The, you know, the wives of the miners. There's a lot so of many new... working in kitchens. Yeah. Some giving food parcels out. I were on picket lines and we're now speaking. Yes. All over the country. They tell me, did the women get brutalised as well? Did, they, did the women get beaten too? They beat the women too? Yeah, those have got no fucking teeth. They knocked your teeth out? The copper did, yeah. Oh, shit. They were, uh, I were on an old women's picket line in Nottingham. And I'd lost me dad. I lost me dad during strike. <laughs> and um, my mum kept pleading, let me come with her. No, I heard me had to marry. Anyway, they kept going on. I said, yeah, well, stop it back. Yeah. I can't look after you and look after myself. Yes. I knew I'd be a front. Well, I turned around with Mum and my Auntie Mary stood there, the bleeders. And uh, I looked down and this copper kicked my mum's leg. And I said, kick her leg once more and I'll kick your bollocks so far up your fucking muck the rest of your life. <laughs> that and was he, enough, was it? <laughs> well, no, he kicked her again. Oh, no. Uh, and then... And then you got attacked? No, they told me to, to, I wanted to go to the toilet and this pub where we stood, there was go. And uh, me being mouthy, <laughs> turned around and said, it's the first time they've been on piss duty. Well, I couldn't afford to go to the dentist. Oh no. So, Not how many teeth were knocked out? They did only knock one tooth out. Yeah. But I couldn't, um, I couldn't afford to go to the dentist. <sighs> And then, <coughs> when, I, when I called, I had some, um, them, uh, the some minions. Implants, yeah. implants, yeah. Uh, and then, uh, my bowel burst. And Nathan's didn't, it's here to knock me cheap breasts about. Oh, God. <laughs> so. I'm You're like, a ca casualty of war, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So, oh God, and you're still here today? I'll, I'll still fight till my last breath. <laughs> Did you ever meet Arthur Scargill? Oh yeah, <laughs> me and Anne were good friends. Yeah. But he's coming today, isn't he? Yeah, I'm, he's supposed to be speaking, might be end up March. Yeah, and uh, the lawyer as well, you know, Gareth Pierce. Yeah. Oh, she's wonderful. <laughs> well, his wife's got Alzheimer's, you know, Anne. Oh really? Yeah, she's in a bad way. Oh, that's sad. Arthur still seems in fine fettle, don't you think? Oh, yeah. We heard him speak at, at Hatfield. Oh, he's a brilliant speaker, oh, brilliant. Yeah. yeah. He spoke about Palestine as well. That's how he started. Yeah. He said, I'm going to speak about that. And, he, you know, the whole thing was about the 40-year anniversary, right? Yeah. Right up uh, by the pit. But he spoke about the people of Gaza first and said, this has to stop. It was Arthur's uh, idea, you know, that we set up pit camps. Was it? Yeah. <laughs> Our village was the first one to have a pit camp. Were you? <laughs> oh, that's good. Oh. It's been an honour to talk to you. Pardon? It's an honour to talk to you. Don't be daft. Oh. <laughs> I'm just daggy. <laughs> When are we 
you're going to get to hear Arthur? At the, at the end. At the end? And is Gareth yeah. Pierce coming too? She's speaking just before Arthur, yes. And this gentleman will be speaking next. All right, so your name is? John Dunn. John Dunn. Like the poet? But better. <laughs> and without an E on the end. <laughs> so tell me, if Gareth Pierce is yeah. a great one to have on side. What role did she play back she, then? She represented a lot of the miners at the trial in 1985. Oh, right. Yeah. Was there any compensation paid out? There, there was some, yes, for miners who choose to do it, but the compensation was settled out of court. Oh, was it? So there was no acceptance of any responsibility yeah. Uh, yeah. or liability. Yeah, so that's, that's what you're that's saying. Like, that's what we're fighting for now, that's yeah. It's got to be publicly admitted, <laughs> right? Absolutely, yes. What would it cost now? Monetary compensation is one thing. What we need is the accountability of, of what they did and why they did it. So yeah. that's the important thing. And who was involved? Was the, it the army? Was, sorry, Were the we army need involved? To march, sorry. Sorry. No, we're, we're not. We're talking about the state ordering the police to use force against minors. Yes. Well, some people said there weren't any numbers on the uniform. Yeah, that's, that's true. Yeah. <laughs> I'm getting ready for a cup of tea. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Today is also the 40th 
anniversary to the very day that John Green was murdered on our picket line. So I think it would be very fitting if just for a few seconds we raise our fists and bow our heads in tribute to those two fallen comrades. Thank you, comrades. We must never forget that they paid the ultimate price. And by the way, as well as mentioning that, Rose gave my entire speech that I planned to make. <laughs> so once again, I've got to wing it, so bear with me. Now this morning, I did an interview for Radio 4. We Derbyshire miners, being the most sophisticated <laughs> miners, speak to a more upmarket audience, obviously. But the most ridiculous question I got asked was, do you regret the miners' strike? My reply was, no, I'm bloody proud of it. And I will do it again today at the drop of a hat. I might miss out a bit of her getting my head smashed in though, <laughs> if possible. But I think it's important that we use words like proud, that we stand tall, because comrades, all we miners that stood solid, everybody that supported us, the incredible women that have already been mentioned, we stood tall for a whole year. We never bowed, we never faltered, and that's what we celebrate. We're not here to mourn a defeat. We're here to celebrate standing tall and standing proud. And in this day and age, let's be honest, there's quite a bit that we could get despondent about. Food banks, walking just a few hundred yards up to this rostrum. I passed two homeless people sleeping in the street. We've got poverty like we've never seen. We've had a widespread war for 40 years on our communities and our class. But do you know, we mentioned and we stated that if we lost, the whole working class were lost. Our great leader, Arthur Scargill, and I'm just the warm-up act today. <laughs> the greatest trade union leader ever. He's still here. We're still here. We're still fighting. And Thatcher's dead! <laughs> victory comrades and in this day and age of half day strikes a strike here a strike there what a momentous achievement to keep it going to keep us fed when our union funds were seized when our assets were frozen when we were attacked when we were brutalized when we were called the enemy within well, I'm proud to still be an enemy with me. And do you know who are the real enemies? It's not the homeless. It's not the disabled. It's not the people without a job. It's not the people that these in our political elite of all parties demonize. And it's definitely not people trying to escape wars caused by our munitions who want to save life. They're definitely not the, uh, the people that we should fear. The people in boats that we should fear and fight are the ones in the tax havens, the Philip Greens who stole 
his workers' pension money, who lives on a yacht in Monte Carlo. Michelle Moon, the Tory Baroness, who stole £200 million by issuing false PPE and fled on a boat, living in warmer terrains than we exist today. They're the real bold people that we should fight, and they're the real enemy within. Together with the ruling class represented on all sides in Parliament, the ones who issue the diktat to any government to impose austerity, to attack our class, and worst of all, it's been mentioned, they nick class war reparations. The war against we miners still goes on. They've nicked something like eight billion quid from collective pension funds. And we don't just want things right in, we want that bloody money back. We should be spending that, keeping our communities alive. Well, you know where it's going? It's going in the same place as your tax bounds. It's flowing uphill to the wealthy. It's being stored in tax havens in the Caymans. And worst of all, that money is paying for bombs to murder innocent civilians in Gaza. That money is being used to arm nothing but Nazis in Ukraine. If we stand at the brink of an all-out nuclear war in which we're being pushed by the political elite, and it's going to be funded by your money. So if there's any reasons to fight back, that has to be one of the best. But comrades, as I say, 40 long years struggling for justice. And as I say, we're all still here. But you know, coming are more battles. There are going to be more fights that we face. Changing one set of establishment goons for another won't change anything. It's only when we get our revenge, I want revenge for what happened to me and thousands of my comrades in that strike. I want revenge for the destruction and the abandonment of our communities. I want revenge for everything that's been inflicted on our class. And most of all, I want revenge for those two murdered pickets. And do you know what our revenge must be, comrades? I'm not talking about a bloody massacre revenge, although I'm open to suggestions. I'm talking about abolishing this rotten system that creates food banks, that creates poverty, that steals our wealth. I'm talking about that new society that we've got to fight for. A society based on need, not greed. That has to be our ultimate revenge. So comrades, join the fight. As I say, polish your picketing boots. Get ready for the next struggle. Because next time, comrades, we're going to win. Solidarity. Very shy, John Doug. Um, we've had some media attention this year. It seems if you've got a zero in your anniversary, people want to talk to you. It's very important that what gets reported here, uh, what happens here today is reported. Um, that in the mainstream media, we all know back in 1984, that a lot of the mainstream media were not on our side. And I just want to make one point very quickly, because through some of their own camera lenses, on that very day at Orgreave,
they saw the truth about what happened. And that footage is at the BBC still. It is there. When minors were waiting to go on trial, the BBC had footage showing what really happened. They sat on it for 40 years and they are still sitting on it. It's oh. shameful. Yeah. And this is why we do need media that reports what we really, really need to read about. And it's therefore my great honour to introduce the co-editor of Tribune, Taj Ali. I was in Sheffield a few weeks ago talking to former members of the Sheffield Asian Youth Movement. They took me to Aubrey, the site where they organised and stood shoulder to shoulder with the miners. And the reason they stood shoulder to shoulder with the miners is because they were the children of factory workers and mill workers. They understood what class meant. They understood what exploitation meant. They understood what community meant. And they fought the racism of both street gangs and the state. And it's exactly and precisely for that reason that, that when the violence was inflicted on the mining communities, they understood what the state was capable of. And they were part of a broad coalition of groups, women against pit closures, lesbians and gays support the miners, the Indian Workers Association, black people support the miners. Though many of them had no connection to the mining industry, they had a connection to the working class. And they understood that an attack on one is an attack on all. Why do you commemorate Aubrey 40 years on? It's in the past. The reason we commemorate this injustice, the acts of violence against mining communities fighting for their jobs, for their communities, for their livelihoods, is because the same pattern has been repeated. You look at Grenfell, the anniversary was just yesterday. You look at Hillsborough, you look at the post office scandal, you look at the Windrush scandal. This is the pattern. Working class communities always treat it as criminals first and victims second. And the real criminals are always let off scot-free. We see whitewash after whitewash, lies after lies, cover-up after cover-up. And we've had enough. And that's why it's important to link all of these different struggles together. Because if there's one lesson we can take from the miners' strike and how they sustained those picket lines for a year, it is solidarity is the greatest strength of our movement and we need to maintain that solidarity. If you look at the rhetoric deployed by people like Thatcher, the enemy within, mob rule, a threat to democracy, we see the same rhetoric today, often used against British Muslims, often used against people standing up against genocide in Gaza, often used against the striking doctors and nurses and railway workers and teachers and everyone else. And that's the lesson here. They hate all of us. They like to play us off against each other. Unfortunately, the far right have been gaining traction in working class communities. And if you look at Farage, the pound shop Enoch Powell, the privately educated former banker. He wants to fool working class people into thinking he stands up for their interests. The man will never talk about child poverty. The man will never talk about poor pay and conditions. The man will never be found on a picket line. These fraudsters need to be called out and our movement has to be present in working class communities. We have to build the alternative. Labour have promised an inquiry and while that's welcome, that's just the first step. We need to ensure the inquiry delivers. We need to ensure that there is accountability, that there is justice, that people have to face up to their responsibility for the violence inflicting on the miners and the mining communities. And let's not kid ourselves, as much as we'd like to see the Tories moving out next month, it's not going to be sunshine and rainbows when Labour get in. We have to be demanding, as much as we want an inquiry, we want them to tackle the inequalities that still exist in pit communities, in working class communities. We want an industrial strategy. We want you to protect the jobs of the Tata steel workers in Wales. We want you to stand up for the oil and gas workers in Scotland. We want you to provide an alternative as we move closer to a climate transition. We believe we can tackle climate change, we can invest in our communities, and we can have prosperous jobs. 
and it's our duty and our responsibility to ensure that our children have a bright future, that our children don't have to go through what the miners went through. Because believe me, these people will do it again and again and again. It's a tried and tested formula. So our responsibility today is to educate young people about the struggles that have gone before us. Why? Because we know that our rights and freedoms were never given to us by the benevolence of the state. Right now, they're trying to undermine our right to strike, our right to protest. These were hard fought rights. The charters, the levelers, the diggers, the cold-blooded martyrs, all of these people in history fought for those rights. And now we have to continue fighting for those rights. So let's connect the struggles, let's fight the far right, let's demand a real alternative for working class people. You know you can stand and to fight against those who try to fight us. Amazing. Um, we've got a fuller message from Maria from the uh, Cuba Solidarity Campaign. So, Please, uh, she's so sorry that she can't be here. Uh, I'm just going to hand over to Kath uh, and they're going to read it out. Hello, thank you very much. I've just got this uh, brief message from Maria of the Chile Solidarity Campaign. She can't be with us today because her mum has just passed, but she has this contribution specifically about her mum's involvement in uh, supporting the miners as a Chilean refugee uh, fleeing from Pinochet's coup. On my mum's wall proudly hangs a Women Against Pit closure plate from the time she and my dad stood shoulder to shoulder with the miners and their families as the British state threw everything they had at them. She sat alongside thousands of women from across the country, recognising in their struggle her own. Knowing what it is to stay up all night, worrying where the next meal was coming from, and still getting up to send your children to school happy. My parents had arrived years earlier as former political prisoners of Pinochet's regime, and we were welcomed by the labour movement. We were dispersed to Rotherham and my siblings and I grew up in Dalton, across the road from the Baggin, the infamous Silverwood Miners Welfare Club, which still exists today. There, the miners held solidarity events for the Chileans, opening up their community, their minds and their hearts to our plight. Our fight against Pinochet would resonate even more profoundly when Thatcher was elected and brought in the same ideologies of our dictator by the bullet instead of the ballot box. Today, my family and I aren't with you because we are with my mum's bedside as she struggles with her horrific lung condition and sadly she passed away today. It is not lost on me that the painful and awful deaths of millions of former miners from lung conditions whilst their families can do nothing to help. The debt this country has with miners and their families long precedes the miners' strike and it is a disgrace that the pensions are yet to be fair and dignified. What my mum taught me is the importance of solidarity the humanity of shared struggles and the love that bonds the working class wherever you come from. La lucha continua, compañeros. We are always with you, always. Thank you so much. A powerful message from the Story Solidarity Campaign. It's now my great pleasure to introduce someone who's fought injustice all her life and represented the miners at the Orgreave trial. Here's Gareth Pierce. Nobody ever hears me. Can anyone hear me? This is a first. The year of the strike was a year of terminology about war. The government called it war. The government talked in terms of war, talked in terms of the enemy. And when the apex of that war, visual apex, happened, it was not surprising. It was called the Battle of Aubrey. There were two parts of the understanding of the strike. One was the government, who understood and articulated that it was war. The others were the miners who equally understood that it was war. Most of the rest of the country did not understand the enormity and the appropriateness of the terminology. 
But what Orgreave did, it brought to a climax what the government wanted. It was a demonstration of power. It was a demonstration of relentless cruelty. And it was an epitomization of what was always intended. To destroy a union, to destroy its members, to destroy the communities in which they lived. The government and the miners could see through the same lens, the wider view, the bigger picture. Many of the rest of us didn't have that comprehension at the time of all grief. I came into the Battle of Orgreave in the aftermath at the police station in Rotherham with 95 men bleeding, traumatized, being told that they were facing charges that carried life imprisonment. And I was seeing it through a narrow lens, a narrow lens the police must have gone mad that day, that something unusual or unintended had happened. But in realizing in whatever narrow understanding that it was a war, we realized we had to fight. We had to arm ourselves in the same way, even though those who had been captured were not arrested. They were seized as if it was a war. They were captured like prisoners of war. There was no pretense of interviews, police interviews, to understand what each man's motivation might have been before he was charged. The charges were drawn up in advance. <coughs> the intention was there in advance. Our weapon was very simple. Trying to evidence what actually happened on that day, we could collect from the campaigners and the observers who were there that day, one by one, every single photograph. We got by the end, before the trial, to know every dip in the road, every bump in the hill, what you could see from where. That was our advantage, because the police knew nothing. They knew nothing of what happened that day. They did not know who they had captured or why. They were in total ignorance. They knew one thing. When we had to organize, between prosecution and defense, who would go first in the first trial. They knew they did not want Russell Broomhead, the man who had been truncheoned, despite all the media lack of coverage, the man in the red shirt who had been shamelessly truncheoned that the nation could see. He was the man they didn't want in that first trial. But armed with that information, it was around. There was absolutely no possibility that any of the men could be convicted once the mendacious police evidence was called. Bit by bit, Clements, the officer in charge, the guy was black with missiles, no, it wasn't. Let's have a look at the police video that you're not playing. Nothing, nothing. A lovely sunny day. There was fear throughout. Fear throughout. Despite the prosecution having to abandon the trial as lie after lie. Police having to eat their notebooks over lunch. Suddenly notebooks disappeared. 
because they realized they were heading for a charge of perjury in what they were saying. It was spectacular. Police claiming that they had seen people, arrested them, brought them to the holding center. Photographic evidence. It wasn't that police officer at all. What were you doing, police officer? Oh, well, I was lying down. It was a sunny day. I was told to go into a classroom and just write down what happened. It was a rout, it was a victory, but it was bittersweet. And there was comradeship, there was extraordinary, loving, warm, supportive comradeship. Arthur's gargle came of an evening and just talked to us. We learned a great deal. But that was then. It was only 30 years later when government documents began to be disclosed that you saw the real picture. It was never an accidental police going mad on that day. It was never a stupid, power-crazy chief constable organizing it that was a work. No, it wasn't. Long before the Thatcher government came into power, there was planning. The Ridley Report was planning for this. And 30 years on, in the government archives, as they grudgingly come to be disclosed, you see it all. The plan to go for the strongest union, if we can get the strongest union, then we're on the way to privatizing everything. Explicitly said in government notes, but including one little note that says, actually we mustn't record our meetings too much on paper. We, sh we should just speak to each other orally. But nevertheless, there's a paper trail. And the paper trail is appalling. The paper trail talks of knowingly what this would do, that it would destroy communities, it would destroy an industry intentionally. It could achieve starvation by orchestrating the awarding of benefits or not. It could starve the miners into submission and it will be a lesson to all. There is that horror now to be confronted that governments can do this. They can do it in plain view and they can do it despite extraordinary resistance. But we do know now. We know what the miners knew. We know what the government knew. And we know what much of the country was blind to, but now it's there to be seen. And we have to take that lesson of what we can do to ourselves, how ignorant and stupid and cruel we can be to ourselves. And so, just to thank you for what the lawyers learned. Thank you for learning how to resist Thank you for the beauty and the extraordinariness of the experience. I'm sorry that it happened. I'm sorry it happened, but what a glorious thing. Thank you. An exceptional from a truly exceptional lawyer and we're honoured to have her here today. We've now reached our final speaker and I don't think uh, saying it's a great honour does it justice to be quite honest um, but I am proud as punch to be able to hand you over now as the final speaker of this tremendous rally to
the President of the National Union of Mine Workers between 1982 and 2002. A President who led from the front, Arthur Scargill! <laughs> I want to begin by stating what we should be with. The genocide of the Palestinians is going unchecked. The fascist state of Israel is carrying out a program of extermination aided by the United States and, yes, the United Kingdom. Some 38,000 people have been killed in Gaza, on the West Bank and in East Jerusalem. 45% of those killed have been children. Nearly 85,000 have been wounded. Who are they? Were they doing something to help? The United Nations resolutions and decisions are welcome, but it's clear they're not going to stop the genocide. The answer must come from all the Palestinian Arab neighbors whose peace walking over the last eight months has led to nothing. It's time for them to mobilize a military response and send an armed support and armies to Palestine to drive the fascist Israelis out from Gaza and out of the territory illegally occupied from 1967. It's appropriate that I'm speaking here today in Sheffield, the city where 40 years ago I addressed a crowd just a few hundred yards away outside St. James's house following the National Executive Committee unanimously for the face of the sun, if they're here, that means they're everybody. <laughs> <laughs> they sanctioned the NUM areas could take strike action against pit closures in accordance with the union's rule, national rule 41. In marking the 40th anniversary, of the miners strike, I want to pay tribute to all the miners and their families who in 1984 and 5 fought the greatest workers fight since the days of the Merthyr Rising, the Tolpuddle Martyrs, the Newport Chartists, the Featherstone Martyrs, us, yes, and the suffragettes. It's an honour and always has been to have young miners fighting for the future and the magnificent women against pit closures who for a year have fought From the start of that strike on the 12th of March 1984, I believe that the target was the steel plants. Why? Because I knew why I've been passed information from the highest level. They only had three weeks to supply. And for reasons I don't know why, even the National Executive Committee believed that the real targets were the power stations and pickets into the areas like Nottingham and South Derbyshire who had not have taken a decision to strike. But from the start, it was obvious that that was the change. In May, we began picketing on 22nd of March. It was obvious to me then that the police 
in numbers were already present. On the first day I was there, on the 23rd of May, I got knocked over a fence, by accident of course. By the time we reached the 30th of May, I was arrested. The charge, I wanted to go to the spot we were in from the 22nd of May. I was being denied the right and all the pickets who were with me to take picketing duties in accordance with the United Nations Charter and the conventions of the International Labour Organization. That strike was legal because it was an area strike. There were judges in the High Court consistently referring to the failure to have a ballot before a national strike. They knew pretty well it was an area a strike. They knew well that the rules of the union we gave us permission and yet they chose to ignore it. The union set up a national coordinating committee. We approached the deputies union, NACOS. They didn't want to know but they said we will picket our men in no hope they will not be going into work. And they did that. We met with Bill Sears of the Steel Union, who in 1980, we had taken hundreds of miners in Sheffield and closed the steel plant. We said, reciprocate, give us support. We don't want resolutions. Pull your members out on strike. When we took our members down, we closed the plant. And Bill Sears, two hours later, gave an instruction to reopen it. That's called sabotage and treachery by trade union leaders. <laughs> Having been arrested, I knew what the problems were. I knew what the strength was. I'll tell you how I knew. It wasn't something magic in my head. George Moores, a member of the South Yorkshire County Council, responsible for major incidents, passed to me a document sent down from central government telling them how many police were drafted in to South Yorkshire and in particular to deal with the area in and or around Orbreed. The number of police, the riot police, were 8,200. That was the figure. When we finally persuaded the NEC to agree that areas who took strike action were doing it in accordance with law and rule, we faced them with 10,000 pickets. But we did so in a planned way. I'm sick and tired of listening to people say, we walked into a trap. We didn't. We'd be picketing from the 22nd of May. When we went down on that day, they again stopped us. And again, we knew we were in for a fight. They had horses, dogs, long shields, short shields, truncheons, and a determination like a fascist state would have. They intended to inflict maximum injury wherever they could. The chief inspector, who Gareth Pierce has referred to, made clear 
that he exempted what was taking place. He'd been instrumental in coordinating the action. It didn't suddenly come down. It was planned because they knew we were going down. I arranged for walkie-talkies to be handed to five people in our union at strategic points. And by the way, they never say anything in the media, but part of our delegation, our strike committee, occupied the plant, the strict pickets from Hatfield, only briefly, but it demonstrated the power that we could exert. The government, of course, were determined to do everything they possibly could to inflict the maximum punishment on the National Union of Mine Workers. I've seen not only government papers before the strike, but also after the strike. And I know that the area that was troubled and worried and frightened that Thatcher and the government was Aubrey, Ravenscraig, Hartlepool, Port Talbot and Hollywood, all power stations because they burned coke and the coke came from coking plants and all over those were picketed. The fundamental difference between the Battle of Saltney in 1972 and 1984 was that in 1972 workers in other industries pulled out their plumbers and they joined the picket line, closed the plant and won the magnificent victory. I describe it as the greatest day of my life. And the chief constable in Birmingham said, would you do me a favour? Would you move the crowd? You've achieved your objective. I said, yes, on two purposes. One, you allow me to make a speech. And two, can I order your loudspeaker? Because mine's knackered. <laughs> he agreed. And I spoke from the top of a urinal. <laughs> and I was very proud of what had happened. The same thing was happening at Aubrey. And after I was knocked unconscious in that famous day on the 18th of June, yes, I was knocked out as well, put in a hospital bed. I knew what the policy was. It was being achieved. How many people in this crowd realise that the chairman of British Steel said to Telex, ordering the closure of Orgreave that night? Nick Jones of the BBC is here today, can confirm. He showed me that document, that Telex. In other words, we were winning. Dennis Doody, who was a full-time organiser of UCA, heard it from the radio in Sheffield. In other words, there was every reason to increase and not decrease the picketing on that date. In fact, I urged all the area leaders who had taken strike action and were there that day on the 18th, that on the 19th they should increase it and pull in people from Sheffield in the engineering works, as we had done in Salt Lake from the engineering works. There was no reason why not for Blanche Flannery was in charge of the people in the trade union movement that had given an undertaking 
that they would do everything they could. We had other trade unions committed themselves to action. But for some reason, I never understood. Picketing was withdrawn at a time when I wasn't there. But in any event, that day will go down in history as one of the greatest fight backs ever seen. The CEGB estimated that it only got six months supply. And of course Thatcher, I don't know why she did it, but in her autobiography, she devoted a chapter of 40 pages to me. <laughs> it's headed Mr. Scargill's insurrection. I thought, it should be, secretly. When you read it, it's an interesting read. All those so-called historians who so far have never hit the truth, have a look. She says that Mr. Scargill outwitted us. And then she goes on to say, the problem we've got is at the steel plants and the coking plants. And that is where we have to concentrate what we have to do. She admitted that they would not be able to withstand any longer than three to five weeks. That's what she says. And we picketed on an ongoing basis, not only at Aubrey, but in other places as well. In other words, what we were doing was the right thing. Our people were aware of what we were doing. Then we had a negotiating tear. We had that clown McGregor with a paper bag over his head. <laughs> and we had the deputies union, NACODs. They took a decision with a ballot of 82% to take strike action. We met them at ACAS, the conciliation body. We were in one room, they were in another, the coal board in another, and of course ACAS officials in another. The idea was to go from one to the other, seeking a solution. We knew for a fact there could only be one solution, and that would be if we could join with a union that had just taken the decision by an 82% ballot to take strike action in the mining industry. So I was delegated to go to the deputy's room. I did. And I put to them a proposal that we had agreed. And I suggested that if they could accept that, we could have a united front and there's no doubt we would have won. What happened? They accepted. That trade union, the National Association, shop fighters, deputies, accepted our script and agreed to come out on strike. All of a sudden, the tables had turned. ACAS officials met us and said, we can see nothing wrong with your proposal. We thought we'd got them. The call board with McGregor said, I'm off. And they went. And of course, if you read Thatcher's autobiography, what she says in that, if this strike takes place, namely the deputies union and the NUM, we will have to concede defeat and settle on terms agreed at ACAS. The person who told me was a senior member of the Tory government. Years later, 
in a situation following a television program in which I was being interviewed. And he was being interviewed. And he approached me. I'd never seen him before. And he said, Arthur, can I ask you a question? I thought, what the hell is it? He said, why is it that when the under managers took their decision to strike, I said, do you mean the deputies trade union, NACOS? Oh yes, he said, that's the one. He said, why was it that when they took a decision to strike, we, that's the Tory government, understood from the commission by Thatcher, she organised the commission of ministers and said, if this goes ahead, we have to concede and agree the terms that have been agreed by NACOX and the NUM at that time. Three days later, I could feel a change in the air. I couldn't get contact with the deputies union. And I told Mick McGacky and Peter Heathfield, my vice president and general secretary, that there was something wrong. And there was. What was wrong was that they changed their position. And they decided to accept a negotiated agreement that wasn't binding, that didn't include a decision that no pit would close unless exhausted or on safety grounds. Why, he said, why did they change their mind? Particularly, by the way, another one for the historians, on that day, Maycock's officials, the President and the General Secretary, were persuaded and cajoled by the TUC for the first time in history to take strike action. In other words, go ahead, because that will win. And yet they pulled away. And as a result, we lost that battle. And what the position today. I want to ask, because all those men and women who were blooded at Orgreave have the right to know. And I still plead and demand an explanation. Why did they do it? It was sabotage. It was betrayal. And quite frankly, it's something I will never understand. I'm privileged that I was a member of the NUM and its president in 1984-5. I'm proud of the fact that so many of our young men and women for the first time took to the streets in support of the miners on strike. They didn't just man or woman soup kitchens they actually picketed. That's why, for a brief period, they were taken into the membership of the NUM. They were the bravest of the brave. It's a privilege for me to be here 40 years on, telling you that Mick McGacky, Peter Heathfield, and Arthur Scargill voted when the decision was taken we voted to continue the strike, and I'm proud of that decision. <laughs> the Miners' strike of 1984-5 remains an inspiration, not only for workers in today's trade union leaders. They should listen to their responsibility come together in direct action, as you've heard other speakers say, and challenge government and employers against all forms of injustice, inequality, 
and exploitation. The unemployment figures are a lie. There isn't 1.2 million unemployed. There's over 10 million unemployed when you count what's described as economic inactive. All of those people are in fact people who can't get money from the government and yet they can't get a job. It's a privilege for me to be here today with all of you that were there on that day. You marched on that day. You fought on that day. The people who were injured on that day did so in a long line, as you heard, of trade unionists throughout history. They themselves, you I'm talking to, daughters and sons of them as well, marched into history. You entered into the pantheon of working class heroes and heroines. Those two lads who rolled down in the course of that strike, we owe it to them to say that never again will we allow it to happen. What we told you then, what I told you then, in 1984, was the truth. It took years for people to understand what we told the truth. I've been called out the name of the sun. I've been described, well, names I can't even remember. <laughs> By the way, I've either met or heckled every Prime Minister since 1950. I've <laughs> never met Thatcher. But what they did do, they put her daughter up to interview me. The first question was, Mr. Scargill, what's it like to be the most hurted person in Britain? I said, I haven't a clue. <laughs> my, name, my name's not Thatcher. <laughs> In the name of the greatest trade union leaders I ever knew, only by reading that people like Jim, the leader in Ireland, of course it was laughing, <laughs> but of course they took action when all of the movement were opposing them. They were right to fight in 1913, and we gave them support all we could, or our forefathers did. And they reciprocated that in 1984 and 1985, when all our young people, young men and young women, took to the streets with us. All I can say is, I salute you. I was proud to be one of you. I'll never forget you. I was a socialist from the age of 16, and I'll be a socialist till the day I die. leaders like Arthur and we wouldn't be in this shit situation we're in today. A massive cheer for yourselves. Thanks for coming today. It's been the biggest all green rally we ever had. And let's hope that we get the justice that we deserve on the story of Valley Berkeley. A special mention for the Tuesday campaign who have been here today and we've worked alongside. Their campaign, they won and so can we. We'll have one finishing song from the PCS band and while that's happening if people can fetch their flags and what have you to the front and then the best bit of the day of course is that we're all going in the Lloyds for a pint and mine's a pint of lager. See you soon.